Welcome to Advancing Our Church, a Changing Our World podcast about Catholic stewardship, leadership, and advancement. I'm Jim Friend. Welcome back, everyone. We have another great show for you today. We're going to be talking about the National Eucharistic Revival, and we'll be speaking with the Executive Director, Tim Glemkowski. Now, the revival was brought back by our bishops in February of this year, and its focus is to enkindle a missionary fire in the heart of our nation as we reconsecrate ourselves to the Eucharist. Now, we all know the importance of this effort from our own experience and, of course, the many guests that we've had on our show where we've talked about how mass attendance has been a concern for every diocese around the country. And all of this is backed up by the Pew Research Center's numbers last December that indicated that three out of every five adults are now disaffiliated with any religion. In 2021, self-identified Christians made up only 63% of our U.S. population which is down 75% from just a decade ago. Just a couple of side notes, we recorded this episode back in August of this year when Tim had just recently accepted the position. And since we recorded the show, we were pleased to learn last month that Condé de Leon, who we've had on our show a couple of times in the past, recently accepted the position as the first Director of Advancement for the Eucharistic Congress. So we're very excited for Conde, who will be a huge resource for Tim. I think you're really going to enjoy getting to know Tim and learning more about this Eucharistic revival and how we all need to have a focus on this renewal. And now, let's get to work. Today, we welcome Tim Glemkowski, the Executive Director of the new National Eucharistic Congress. Tim graduated from Franciscan University of Steubenville, with a double major in philosophy and theology. While teaching high school theology, Tim also received a master's in theology from the Augustine Institute in Denver, Colorado. He has served for several years now in parish life as both a director of youth and young adult ministry and the director of evangelization and catechesis. His favorite thing to do is to hike in the mountains with his wife and his little daughter, Eva. And so, without further ado, here is Tim Glemkowski. Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome to Advancing Our Church. I'd like to welcome Timothy Glemkowski. Timothy, welcome. To, do you go by Tim or Timothy? I'm sorry. Tim's probably good. Yeah. Tim is good. Either, yeah. Either's Tim? fine. Tim is fine. Yeah. Super. Well, welcome, Tim. So glad to, glad to have you here with us on Advancing Our Church. Tim's the Executive Director of the National Eucharistic Congress. We're going to have a discussion around that today. It's a, it's a brand new organization, and Tim is a brand new Executive Director and uh, why don't we start with a prayer? Tim, would you would you offer a prayer for us this morning? Happy to. Yeah, yeah. Let's pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, we just ask for uh, you to pour out your Holy Spirit on our conversation and uh, to enlighten the minds and hearts of many that might come to recognize your presence and uh, your, your being with us in the Eucharist. And over this next three years, that it might be a moment of healing, uh, conversion, formation, uh, missionary sending for the church in the United States. Um, that you might surprise us in all you're going to do over the next few years. In Jesus' name, uh, through the intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. Um, So, Tim, uh, tell us, I guess maybe we should start first things first. Um, I know that the National Eucharistic Congress just was just literally formed this year, I believe, in February. Uh, Tell us, how did the organization come about? Yeah, so it's a little bit going all the way back. in, uh, it, it's really part of the National Eucharistic Revival Project that's been launched by the U.S. bishops. That's sort of the umbrella under which we've been uh, sort of launched as a speedboat uh, to get some uh, con- concrete initiatives done related to that. So yeah. in 2019, uh, the Pew Research Study came out that showed you know, an alarmingly low percentage of Catholics believing in the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. So 30% said had a kind of an understanding of the church's teaching in that area. And um, that the bishops immediately started thinking about Bishop Barron was the head of the committee on evangelization at the time and sort of started ideating around this idea of how do we address this problem? This is such a fundamental, you know, issue for our church. And then COVID hit, you know, and planning slowed down. And then it was picked up by Bishop Andrew Cousins uh, and the committee for evangelization on catechesis at the USCCB um, who really built it out into this vision for a three-year grassroots movement uh, revival that would be sort of everybody all in, uh, you know, us waving the banner, but really inviting local creativity, parishes, dioceses, apostolates, you know, orders, movements, universities, uh, to sort of all operate under this one banner for three years. 
the National Eucharistic Revival. So in June 2021, that revival was voted on by the U.S. bishops and overwhelmingly decided, yes, we should do that. That should be sort of our clarion call to the church over the next three years, uh, which I think is very providential. Like, I think it's sort of God is going to do something. We're in a unique time in the world, right? It's not like, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on, right, in the church and in the world in terms of, you know, division and and, and difficulty and, and doubt. And um, I think God's doing something really powerful Uh through this revival to heal, form, convert, unify, and send us on mission. And so in November of 2021, the bishops had to vote sort of a follow-up vote on that initial one to say, as part of this three-year revival, this grassroots, you know, movement, does it make sense for the movement to have a moment? You know, in 2024 in Indianapolis, uh, June 17th to 21st, does it make sense to have a a sort of large gathering of almost 100,000 Catholics all together uh, a, a, a renewing of the National Eucharistic Congress movement. So we used to do these um, in the 30s, 40s, uh, even the 20s. You know, it was like every four or five years, and they got bigger each time. You know, I think it was Cincinnati, and then there was, uh, you know, I think the last National Eucharistic Congress was St. Paul. There was a big international one in Chicago, and they kept getting bigger. You know, uh, first, you know, first maybe 100,000 millions by the end, and the final mass is sort of as this you know, unique, like evangelistic moment for the, the church to gather together and be unified. It's like, do we want to revitalize that tradition was sort of the vote in front of an overwhelming majority of the, the bishops, over 90% of the bishops said, yes, we want to have this. And so in order to do that, though, and this national Eucharistic procession that we're planning, you know, across the country, a walking pilgrimage with Jesus in the Eucharist to that event, that there's, those are complex logistical uh, things, you know, and um, so they, they knew they needed to launch a, a 501c3 apostolate that would be, uh, you know, sort of closely related and tied to the revival, but also, like I said, a speedboat able to navigate um, in in some ways to to do that and to, to start this movement again, redo these congresses every four or five years, you know, into the future. And so, yeah, they founded that organization in February. I was hired in April. And uh, we're off and rolling in startup mode. Well, when it, with a ninety percent uh, approval rating, I, I mean, I don't think too many uh, too, too many presidents could ever really boast that one. I, that's uh, that's a pretty nice imprimatur uh, from the uh, an, an endorsement from the USCCB. That's tremendous, and I would imagine um, you received a lot of outpouring and support since you started. Yeah, I think that's what's sort of unique about it, or the blessing yeah. of it. So I've I've, I've worked. I've started two different apostolates. So oh. I was the president and founder of a of a, a project from the Augustine Institute in Amazing Parish called um, uh, Revive Parishes, and just sort of helped them launch that and get that off the ground, that platform. And then I'd founded an apostolate in 2016. Um, that when I'd gone to work for the Archdiocese of Denver, we had sort of uh, winded down, called Lalto Catholic Institute. But um, the difference is, yeah, we're sort of the, the blessings of, of being an apostle. We have five bishops and four lay people on our board. And so it's very much so, um, you know, Bishop Andrew Cousins, who's the chairman of the Committee on Evangelization, is the chairman of our board. Like, it's all very closely related and under the umbrella and, and with the blessing of the bishops. And like you said, 90% of them sort of saying, we want this and we want to yeah. help, you know. But at the same yeah. time, sort of that agility um, as an apostolate to uh, to move uh, quickly um, and in, in, in getting pr uh, projects done. So it's, it's kind of a unique, uh, yeah, it's, it's in some ways sort of a, a cheat code or something, you know, just a really a blessing. Well, I, and, and, you know, we, we've done a, a number of different podcasts where, you know, we're, we're hearing about, you know, de declining mass attendance, um, more people viewing mass online and that maybe not coming back in person it feels like there couldn't be a better time for this kind of a revival, this reawakening of our appreciation and for our love for the Eucharist. Yeah, COVID, I think, showed uh, both people's hunger for the Eucharist and also, you know, maybe some of what happens in terms of, you know, most dioceses I talk to are, you know, are still not seeing pre-COVID levels in terms of mass attendance. Right. And I think some of that's related to you know, if, if it's not really Jesus, you know, if that's, right. if that's Jesus, then I'm, I'm never going to miss if it's not, or if I'm not sure it is, you know, then other things might take precedence. And so, um, yeah, I think it's, you think of this whole revival and it's like, what do we want to do? It's like, I think everybody in some ways can get pulled in deeper, but in a unique way, I think it's, you know, for sleepy Catholics, those of us who have, you know, sort of need a, a reawakening in our faith, you know, for us to wake up, 
uh, I think for nominal Catholics, those who might identify or grew up as Catholic. And if you call them on the phone, they might still say like, yeah, sure. Like that's who I am. That's, that's my identity, my, you know, religion wise at least, but might not be practicing. It's like for a moment of conversion there to say, I, I want to take this actually be something I, I, you know, wrap my life around a little bit more. And then even for people who, uh, the de-churched completely or, or unchurched, you know, who, um, might not necessarily have any, you know, sort of faith for this to be a moment of mission, um, to them as well too. So it's sort of like, who's this for? It's like, well, in some ways, all of those audiences, everybody. Yeah, yeah, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, we, you kind of touched on this before there's a, a larger number of nuns, right? Those who have no affili- affiliation than ever before, um and so so you know what i'm hearing you say is in some ways it's kind of almost a, a re-education if you will for some or maybe even a new education for others who never quite understood the the true real presence or the nature of the eucharist in the church yeah i'd say it almost cuts through you know you think of the concentric circles maybe from you know less in, more engaged to less engaged i think it what we want to cut through all of them you know like i think there's a um an evangelistic campaign that um, a diocese I was living in did um, that was helping to invite Catholics back home to mass. And um, I remember we, we did the diocese tracked really, you know, clearly the statistics where it was like a, a very large sort of overwhelming tidal wave of people came back to mass as a result of some of the media campaigns that we did. Um, and then the next year when we did, they did it right before the October count, which is a lot of dioceses do to say like, what's our average, you know, not Christmas, not Easter, like our average sort of Sunday mass attendance. And it went up to like 20% or something. It was like crazy, wow. um, huge jump. Mm-hmm. And by the next year, it was the back to the same number, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think uh, what that shows is people are coming back to something that then they're not sure our witness matters, right? Like, and so for all of us to be converted first and brought deeper first, yeah, we're in a moment where the church needs to become missionary. Like we don't live in this Christendom. My dad grew up South side of Chicago, Polish enclave, St. Peter and Paul, you know, then getting taught by the nuns and all the men were in the Knights of Columbus and all the, right. They're, they're sort of a, a the culture was, was in some ways with the church, you know, and the two, sure. And increasingly, we're in a the, the largest, single largest religious denomination in the United States now is those who profess no religious identity. And so we're in a moment that has more in common with the, the ministry context of the early apostles than 1950s uh, Chicago, you know, like, so we have to, as a church, we have those, are, we have, those are very different modes of acting. Like we, in a missionary context, we act very differently and have for years when missionaries go out, Right than we do in con- places where like the faith is sort of wrapped in with the culture. And we're, we're in this transition now of ages to a, to a missionary context again. And so how do we respond? It's like, well, we need to be sent. Uh, the, the, we have to re-encounter the love of God present in the Eucharist and be healed and converted ourselves. There's so many Catholics I talk to these days that are really wrestling in different ways in their lives and everything going on in the world. And even with the church and disappointment or discouragement there. And it's like, how does the Lord bring us back uh, to a place where we're ready to proclaim Jesus in a compelling way to the culture? Uh, I think it's through a, a renewed encounter with him in the Eucharist. So yeah, it's for uh, everybody, but me first, you know, I, I, in some ways I'm like, I want to be the first fruits of the Eucharistic revival. Like I want, I want God to change my life and come into my life in a new way first um, before he even sends me to anybody else. What's so interesting as you were talking there, especially about um, the diocese that saw that 20% increase, and then it goes back the following um, the following year. It, it reminded me of the book Rebuilt. You know, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Father Michael White and what they did to kind of transform their parish. And it almost seems as though that th- those of us who are in the pew still uh, and still have that appreciation, as you're saying, need to be revived and renewed so that we can be ready to welcome those who may have been away for a while. Yeah, welcome them and present a compelling witness of faith. You know, like I remember when I was 18, I, I grew up, you know, Catholic household, Catholic parents, very, you know, every week we never missed. And mm-hmm. uh, but myself, it didn't, it wasn't really relevant to me. You know, I was yeah. just playing football and whatever. And so um it, I remember it was at a, a youth conference I went to where I heard the gospel proclaimed in a compelling way, like not just like the what of the church, but the why. Like, here's why any of this matters at all. It's this relationship. And what Christ has done for you, and then it was the the witness of like the the speakers the, and and the people that I was seeing there, where it's like there's something they have that I want, 
right? Like from the earliest days of the church, some of the earliest apologetic writings that we have from different, um, you know, with the church fathers, like these early theologians from like, you know, 120, 150 AD, like right out, like they knew, you know, John the evangelist, you know, type people when they defend Christians, you know, cause they're getting persecuted. They're like, wait, you know, like we, there's, there's more here than, than meets the eye. They always point to the unique kind of way of life. And I, and I think we've lost that in some ways, this way to like sort of present a compelling witness and live differently and, and be an image to people. Yeah. Of that welcome and of that love and community and, and faith and, and be able to uh, present a, um, a reason for our own hope. And so, yeah, I think if we're going to, to be on mission, uh, it's not just about what we do. It's not like we need a new program or a new strategy or a new like initiative. Um, it's like, we need to be, uh, we need to first encounter uh, the love of God and be transformed by it in a, in a new way ourselves. I love, I love, I love everything you're saying. And I can see why they brought you on board, Tim, uh, it's certainly coming from a couple of other startups and, and just the energy and expertise that you bring, but how did you find yourself to this new role? Yeah. So I was invited um, by Bishop Cousins to be on the committee for evangelization and catechesis. Mm-hmm. So every, the, the USCCB is this interesting structure where it's, committees on different topics that have chairmen that are elected and then other bishops sort of comprise the committee and they they each have sort of a three-year strategic plan and determine you know sort of their pastoral priorities and get stuff done whether it's on religious liberty or doctrine or you know they all have sort of different roles but each committee also has these like lay consultants that sort of are there to just contribute to the conversation and you know it's sort of like non- voting, you know, members in, in sure. some ways. And so I was one of these six, there's three men, three women. I was one of the, um, the, the guy consultants. And so because of my work, I was working for Archbishop Aquila here in Denver as the director of strategy. So I facilitated his leadership team and then uh, helped to project manage the initiatives from that team related to this vision of a move to an apostolic time and an apostolic uh, mission that we're in. Uh, so because a lot of my work was sort of in that, like, culture and team building and strategy, strategic planning, I was asked to actually lead the initial strategic planning for this, you know, percolating initiative that was, that became known as the Eucharistic Revival. So I've been part of sort of the executive team from it from the beginning and didn't expect a role, you know, in terms of a job uh, at all. I was, you know, I, I loved working for Archbishop Aquila here and it was a huge honor to sort of be doing the work we were doing. And um, it was when the bishops voted I was watching. I'd flown out to Baltimore for our committee meeting and then flown back home, you know, like the early morning, 5 a.m., you know, get in, drive to the office, you know, to the chancery, the pastoral center and uh, watching the vote because we knew the vote was coming. Like, are we going to do this Congress? Are they going to start this 501c3? Because, you know, our committee was the one sort of proposing yeah. uh, the initiative. So I knew about what the, so I'm like, I tune into the vote and I watched this just overwhelming, you know, uh, ascent to the, uh, the thing and and we here in Denver are, are in some ways the product of an event. World Youth Day in 1993 was incredibly uh, formative, you know, for launching the work of the new evangelization here and all these apostolates sure. and vocations and like or like so much, you know, came from that moment. And I remember watching the vote and thinking, "This is it! Like this is the next World Youth Day 1993. Like this is this is going to make a crater impact." in the church. Uh, like this is a gen, like it, it just, I I've been convinced for a while. Like this isn't just like one, like in terms of effort, it's probably the single largest evangelization initiative collectively by the U S bishops ever, but, um, that this moment in a particular way would sort of be a generational moment, uh, mm-hmm. and a renewed missionary sending of the church in the United States. And I remember thinking, all right, like I was watching, I remember kind of like, you know, if you hear the voice in your heart, that's not a voice. It's like, you're supposed to go do that. Wow. <laughs> I remember yeah. thinking like, oh no, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I like my job and, you know, like we're, you know, so um, I really prayed with it. I actually went and talked with Archbishop Aquila first and said, mm-hmm. I'd like to discern this. You know, I sort of was like, I don't want, you know, I want to, so I, we, he, he helped me discern, you know, over those, over those months. And then, you know, they opened an application. I applied, I interviewed, you know, there was a sure. whole process. It wasn't like uh I just walked in and said, Hey, the Holy Spirit said, I have to do this. So you know, <laughs> I'm here. Uh, but uh, no, I just, you know, uh, and they, they ended up offering me the, the, the job in March and I started in April. Oh, congratulations. I can see why that's wonderful. Well, um, Tim, what are you seeing uh, around the country um, with the different dioceses or different parishes that are trying to rekindle uh, a Eucharistic amazement again? Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a lot of good. Um, you know, I think um, I've been impressed by sort of the local creativity. We launched on Corpus Christi this summer uh, with all the processions and each sort of had their own like flavor and, and, but huge. I mean, there was like 5,000 people, you know, in Fort Wayne, South Bend with Bishop Rhodes there did like a three mile Eucharistic procession. And I heard wow. from uh, wow. one of the bishops in Las Vegas that they had had like a couple thousand processing with Jesus in the Eucharist down the strip, you know, like right in the heart of uh, Sin City, right with the, with the Eucharist. And so there's been sort of this amazing uh, uh, launch and, and excitement and energy around it. And that's cool too. Like the Archdiocese of Los Angeles is doing some really neat initiatives. I, I'm like, I can hear all these things. I'm like, I don't want to get like, I don't want to like spoil anybody's, you know, but um, there's a, there's a, like a lot of cool, what I, what I guess I'll say is there's a lot of cool stuff coming. There's a lot of cool stuff already happening in terms of this year is like the diocesan year. So it's focused on diocesan congresses, these big processions yeah. and sort of like reaching leaders. Like how do we help leaders have their own, you know, renewed sort of, um, you know, encounter with Jesus and the Eucharist that when we get to this parish year where we're focused on, we know that there's a very large percentage of Catholics. We've studied it that even in the, who are in the pews every Sunday, who can't really identify the church's teaching on the real presence, you know, it's like a, a very large percentage. So as that parish year focuses on, you know, healing, forming, converting, and unifying in our pews, um, those who are already there, it's like this year we need to reach leaders so that we're all sort of, you know, prepared together, but also have experienced our own personal, again, Jesus never wants to just do anything with us. He wants to like call us to relationship first. You didn't choose me. I chose you. Right. He says, and appointed you to bear right. fruit that will last. And so it's like, any vocation, right? Even your work or, or the work I'm doing, it's it's always like first for us. And then it's for, you know, like he'd rather love us than use us. Um, and so we want to kind of bring that same message to leaders where it's like, hey, before we ask you to go do a bunch of stuff in the parish next year, it's like, let's let the Lord love us all um, in a renewed way. So that's sort of this year. And there's a lot of neat, uh, but, but not just diocese, but apostolates. Uh, mm -hmm. Blessed is she. We just talked to the other day, a ray of hope out east by you, like people who are doing really profoundly interesting, um, uh, you know, events and catechetical programs. And like, it's just, it's just sort of wild how much people have actually responded to. I think it's because it's not overly prescriptive because mm -hmm. Bishop Cousins has sort of had the discipline to say, this is a banner we're waving and we're inviting people to walk and run with us. And it's not just like, here's the program that you have to run and here's your, you know, sort of five steps, you know, kind of thing. Um, I think it's really invited that local creativity from dioceses, parishes and apostolates um, that people have responded to because uh, nobody wants to just, you know, do the latest thing, you know, but it's but this vision has captured and captivated, I think, the minds and hearts of many. Mm. If uh, Tim, if, if there's a pastor or even a bishop who might be listening now and, and they're thinking, you know, how do I get get this going in my diocese or how do I get how do I, you know, get more people to come to adoration or maybe people just to come back to mass? What's your advice to them? You need a team. So the first thing you need is you need a point person. You need a team, right? No bishop, no priest, no pastor can do this alone. They need to assign the person that they're going to like, is going to be their point person at the initiative and then invite a, a team with them who can be creative, but not just creative. Can they can discern God's plan, right? I'm not interested in my plan for Eucharistic revival. I'm interested in like, God's got an idea of what's going to happen in my diocese or my parish, right? So how do we create a, a group that's healthy enough, right? As, as a team that actually knows how to, you know, trust one another to argue to clarity uh, mm. and, and can commit to results and, and hold each other accountable to those. And so it's like with those things in place, then how do you sort of say, all right, in these areas, right, healed, formed, converted, unified, like how are we going to do those things here in whatever context the Lord has given us? And so I think it means, you know, reinvigorating devotion and some of those unique sort of display, yeah, adoration, processions, you know, I, like, I love one parish I heard was going to do a Eucharistic procession around their entire parish boundary, the first Friday of every month, because those first Friday devotions used to be sort of a big thing. And, right. you know, um, yeah, reinvigorating devotion, strong formation and catechesis, like we assume people know, they don't know, like they haven't, you know, they heard clearly and in a way that's defended in scripture and in the church fathers and with Eucharistic miracles and these different things, like, you know, how do we come, present that compellingly in, in homilies and in preaching and, you know, and then I think personal encounters, right? If this is going to be about a missionary sending, it has to be about more than just head knowledge. It has to be something that I've, uh, John Henry Newman talks about the difference between notional and real ascent, right? Like an idea that I've sort of said, yeah, I get it. I believe it fine. Versus something that's real. That's like, I will orient my life around that truth. 
Um, and how do we help people get there? I think it's through personal encounters with Jesus in the Eucharist. So those are a few thoughts. Yeah, those are great thoughts. Tell us a little bit about um, the the actual Congress. Are you is it is it 2024 that you're preparing for? 2024, yeah. uh, July 17th through 21st. Okay. Uh, Indianapolis, Lucas Oil Stadium will be the main venue in the convention center there and some others besides too. I mean, we're, we're hoping, you know, uh, God willing, 80,000 plus attend. It could be higher than that. You know, we're hearing a lot yeah. of enth- enthusiasm around the idea where we're starting to think, oh boy, do we need, you know, do we need a bigger boat? Um, but uh, yeah, it's going to be a kind of a remarkable occasion. I think a, a, a moment of unity for the U.S. Mm-hmm. church to all gather together, a public display of, of of worship and devotion to sort of say, this is what we believe in. Um, and I think kind of a powerful representative display of sort of the the the, the vast experiences of the church in, in the United States in terms of different cultures. And the heart of it all is like the road to Emmaus, right? Like they recognize him. He he preaches the word to them on the way, and then they they recognize him in the breaking of the bread. Yeah. And Pope Benedict XVI, in his first encyclical, said, "You know, being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty ideal, but it's the fruit of an encounter with a person who gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction." Like that's it. Like the thing that makes me excited about this event is thinking of priests uh, fifty years from now or dads dangling a kid on their knee, talking about like. Uh, I, I share with my kids, you know, the, the moment when Jesus changed my life, when I encountered him in the Eucharist, that's what happened at that youth conference. And um, for the, the fact that those kind of stories are going to come from this occasion to me is, you know, worth everything, worth every late night and long travel day. And um, it's going to be remarkable. And then there's the National Eucharistic Procession leading up to it, too, where we're sort of planning these four concurrent walking processions uh, across the country um, to uh, to Indianapolis. So it's going to be a really sort of like, I think for, for three or four months there, like the attention uh, of the entire church in the U S um, and, and maybe even hopefully some secular media will sort of say, like, what are the Catholics doing? You know, it's going to be a really powerful um, witness, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, I'm sure it will, Tim. It's, it sounds awe inspiring and, you know, thank you for taking this on. I, I know you have a young family and so it's certainly a sacrifice. Some of the travel that you do, I'm sure, but it's so needed in our church and um and and just that hunger that the fact that you're going to try to that we're rekindling that hunger for the eucharistic presence in our own life and renewing ourselves through that whole process is it's inspirational for all of us so thank you tell us a little bit about what where can folks find you where can we find updates on the congress how they can eventually register yeah, yeah. So eucharisticrevival.org right now. And if you click on 2024 Congress at the top, you can put your name on sort of the, we'll let you know when registration opens. It shouldn't be too long from now. Yeah. I can't say when exactly it's going to be, but um, sure. we're, we're, you know, sort of uh, making initial plans there and um, sign up for the newsletter, the heart of the revival newsletter. That's really like the drumbeat. If you want to hear about like what's going on and, and what, what this revival is all about. Those two things, just put your emails in and we'll, and we'll get back in touch with you. Just a last thought, you know, you share. I do. I so have a six born, a two-year-old, almost seven-year-old born, two-year-old. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, you know, yeah, you're like, you know, it's pretty, pretty full work. And sometimes, yeah, you're doing it, you know, I'm not that much sleep because the two-year-old was puking or whatever. Like, Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> but here's the thing, Jim, is like, that's why I'm doing it too, you know, right. is um, like the church that they're going to encounter in the world that they're going to encounter over the next they got a lot of life to live and they want to be part of the solution too. And we try to instill in them the idea of like being missionaries themselves. And, uh, but also like, I don't know, there's something about having those kids and thinking about, I I just saw, I've seen some statistics recently where, um, you know, like one of the main reasons that millennial couples said that they weren't having kids was because of like the state of the world, like almost like this idea of like, why would you bring kids into this world, sure. you know, and that, that idea, I get almost what they mean. There seems right. to be a lot of crazy stuff going on, mm-hmm. but at the same time, like, it's like that, that hope for the future is what I think John Paul is my hero in that book, you know, his biography witness to hope. Um, like in some ways I would like this to be, um, to re- reinstill hope in people, uh, that life is worth living and, and the world is worth bringing children into. And I think Jesus and the Eucharist can do that for us. So, uh, yeah, eucharisticrevival.org to hear more. We'll make sure we put links in the show notes and to the website and to your social media accounts too, Tim. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I'm excited. I'm energized by hearing you talk and uh, we'll check in with you as you get a little bit closer and you can share information with us on on how things are going with the registration and just other activities around this new this new organization that you're leading. Thanks so much, Jim. Yeah, it was an honor to be with you and I'll pray for all of your good work too. 
Appreciate it. God bless. God bless. I want to thank Tim for being on our show this week and for taking on this Herculean effort to raise our awareness nationally of the Eucharist. I'll leave links to Tim and to the Eucharistic Revival in the show notes of this episode. And just a reminder, this week, on November 17th and 18th, you can join me at the new Catholic Crypto Conference, either in person at the Valley Forge Sheraton, or you can now purchase a virtual pass to the conference. And if you haven't done so already, I encourage you to pick up your copy of The Generosity Crisis by changing our world CEO, Brian Crimmins, and donor searches, Nathan Chappelle, available now on Amazon. The book releases on November the 15th, which is National Philanthropy Day. I'll leave a link to purchase this book in the show notes of our episode, and you can go back and listen to our last episode where I interviewed both Brian and Nathan on our show. Well, that's our show this week. Special thanks to Pottery Studios for another great show. And if you'd like to help our show, please leave us a rating wherever you downloaded this podcast. If this is your first time listening to Advancing Our Church, I hope you'll stick around and subscribe. You can find us on all places where you download your favorite podcasts. You can find us on YouTube and you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. And for more information about our show, please visit us at advancingourchurch.com. Advancing Our Church is a production of Changing Our World, and we are a fundraising and social impact consulting firm that has been advising both nonprofits and corporations for more than two decades. For more information, please visit us at changingourworld.com. Well, that's it for me, everybody. Between now and our next episode is the Thanksgiving holiday. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend, and we'll look forward to talking with you again during the Advent season. Take care, and God bless.